Hi and welcome to another edition of Seeking Sustainability in Japan. I'm your host, JJ Walsh, here in Hiroshima, Japan. And today I'm talking once again with amazing organic farmer and inspiration for farmers of the future, Chuck Kayser, who runs Midori Farms. Uh, he has taken over a few farms uh, in the Shiga Prefecture and Kyoto Prefecture areas. And he not only provides monthly organic great produce to his customers in that area, but he also does regular events inviting people up to his farm to learn how to farm and to learn the wonders and not only health benefits, but emotional benefits of being able to grow your own food and have that added layer of food security, which we are all thinking about. So I hope you enjoy this episode. And I am talking once again with the amazing Chuck Kayser, who is based in Kyoto, Shiga area, where he does a lot of organic farming and encouraging people to get out and volunteer and learn about growing their own food, as well as encouraging other farmers uh, with a talk show series and a podcast since the last time we talked to Chuck. So I'm really excited to talk to you today. Thanks so much for joining. It's always my pleasure, Joy. Thank you for having me. So just to give people a bit of background, I think I've linked it below. Uh, you joined the series as a guest last summer. And then last autumn, I was able to visit your farm and see it myself in person. And then that second video of visiting your farm has been one of my most watched videos. And uh, we had a great time. Yeah, uh, I planted some niggy green onions with you. And I think this is one of your strengths as an organic farmer. I've talked to other organic farmers uh, in the series before, but you are so connected with the community and always trying to get people out to your farm and experiencing it for themselves. Is that one of your missions to encourage people? For sure, Joy, for sure. I mean, first of all, farmers are nothing without their community. The community is the customer base. Community is the reason we get up in the morning and work in the rain and, you know, pull in all our vegetables and wash them off. And all we can think about is who's going to eat these and who's going to enjoy them and how we're going to help them be more healthy. And so when I've had people at the farm over the years, at first I was like, you want to come? Really? Okay. And then I've seen the way they go home with smiles on their faces, dirty dirt under their fingernails and, uh, you know, a little sunburn on the back of their neck. And it's changed them. I could tell. And it changed me deeply. And that's why I do, I'm doing these two Ted talks this year. Um, and that's what I speak to is how something as simple as producing your own food naturally can, can turn it around for you. It can really connect to, a or recenter you, I guess, maybe a better way of putting it on what's important and what's not. Um, and the great joy that we can take from producing food naturally and watching it grow versus watching something on TV and ordering Uber Eats and, you know, day drinking, you know, like we all have been doing through Corona. So it just kind of gives people a chance to reconnect. So I like that a lot. Yeah. And I think one of the things uh, a lot of people don't realize is how food insecure Japan actually is. And the number of farmers is decreasing every year. Can you just talk a little bit about that? I know that you often talk about that on your, your shows and in your volunteer events, right? That's right, Joy. And thanks for bringing that up because it is something I, I do like to touch on that I think what I just want people to be aware because about four or five years ago when I did started doing Petakucha nights, which are kind of little TED Talk style talk nights here created here in Japan, but now they're worldwide in over a thousand cities, um, Pecha Kucha night. Um, 
I, I had to research. I was like, what am I going to talk about? I, I, I don't know. Just dirt and soil and seeds and plants and stuff. That doesn't sound interesting. How do I bring it home to people that this is so important? And in researching the Ministry of Agriculture, Farming and Fisheries, Forestry and Fisheries, that's MAFF, uh, reports in 2015, they put out a great report and it's in English as well. So anybody can check it out uh, on the website. Um, it's dumbfounding to see that Japan is below 40% self-sufficiency for calories um, and that the average age of farmers is well over 65 years old now and the number of farm closings in the past 20 years is over 35% um, mostly going into corporate farms or just fallow fields and these sorts of things people walk around in Japan and Japan is a wealthy nation it's gorgeous um, we're talking you know state-of-the-art everywhere, technology, um, organic farming, China, Korea, and Japan. This, is a, this book is over 100 years old, and it details how the three nations in a Asia, uh, China, Korea, and Japan, were kind of seen as the pioneers, not the pioneers, but like the standard to uh, try to get to uh, as far as self-sufficiency in farming in the 19 teens and the 1920s, America was in the Dust Bowl and in the uh, era of having a lot of trouble with farms because we didn't know how to do composting. We didn't know how to take care of the soil. So we would just farm the heck out of a plot of land and then it wouldn't grow anymore. So we move on to the next one. We'd clear cut, farm the heck out of that, have to move on again and again. Um, and suddenly there wasn't, you know, there wasn't enough food in America. So this guy comes over to, to Asia and studies about, okay, in Hong Kong, these barges full of human waste are being, you know, carried down the canals and then sold to the highest bidder because that's fertilizer. And everybody's growing food with uh, pack animal, or not animals, um, work animals, like uh, ox and mules and horses and things like that. And all their manure is being composted and chickens as well. And then in Japan, they're all out cutting the grasses around the farms and composting that stuff, Bokashi style and, and other ways that he, he researched all this, took it back to the States to teach Americans how to remember to grow food using a natural system such as composting and things like that cover crops. So I feel like in a way, we're able to kind of give back to, to Japan now for helping us out and reminding them of what they taught us about composting and growing naturally and staying close to the soil uh, as an important factor in being able to be kind of self-sufficient, like you said. Now, Japan, being a modern nation, imports quite a lot um, and exports not as much as it imports, probably, especially food-wise. But um, the thing that remember, to remember is if you want to make a difference in your living in Japan and you want to be more self-sufficient and support that sort of movement of lowering our carbon footprint for food and being more self-sufficient in, in general is reduce the amount of, of meat that you eat and reduce the amount of wheat that you eat because those are the two things that are the biggest in the biggest negative in the negative column to, to, to the biggest degree um now the cows it's very famous kobe beef is world famous so of course we grow wonderful cows here and pigs and chickens too you know you can get some great meats here though i don't eat them um but what are those animals eating and a cow will eat more than its weight in food um, in its lifetime, and all of that is imported um, because we can't grow the grains that they're eating. They should be grass fed. I mean, cows yeah. are, are grass feeders, but there's that's no also, grazing land here and there's no hay here. Yeah, that's always a, an issue, isn't it? A lot of meat alternative proteins, vegan proteins, are made from soy, and people complain all the soy is imported. Well, if you're importing a lot of meat, which Japan does as well, the animals are eating the soy as well. So by cutting out the animal part of the process and eating the soy directly, it is more sustainable. Um, but we should be growing more soy in Japan because we use soy in right. everything in Japan, right? Um, it's a really important crop. Now, since uh, we talked last time, sure. Chuck, you are doing more interviews and podcasts. Let's talk about that a little bit. You did this wonderful interview 
with an older couple about pottery and moving from the city out to the countryside. Um, and you're doing more uh, interviews with people around Japan, for example, talking about zero waste. Uh, with people who are very active in that part or talking with bee farmers about pollinators. Uh, talk a little bit about this mission. Is this a new thing that you're trying to do to bring people together? Yeah, yeah. Um, actually, Joy, you inspired me to, I decided I'm going to do that too. And um, so I started doing a podcast. Actually, I got a grant to open a community farm um, last year. Uh, and what I did was I created a sweet potato farm that people could plug into. They could come and help prepare the grounds, plant out the sweet potatoes, come up and watch them grow, and at the end harvest them And as a big event. So I got some grant money for that. But unfortunately, COVID hit, and so a lot of our live events had to be rethought. And I decided, okay, we'll Zoom. We'll Zoom in. So people were Zooming in to watch me do these things. And I was like, well, this, this isn't enough. I want to do more talk about other people as well. So for one of my monthly events on Zoom, I decided I'm going to interview these two farmers that I know in Kehoku. And I did that and it was very successful. And it's the picture with the three of us wearing masks, actually. Um, but um, they're wonderful people. And I actually ended up taking over their farm. This, Pat, yes, that's them. Ava and Zenyu uh, out in Kehoku at uh, Hello Farm Organics. They're now moved back to Canada and I took over for them this spring. So that's another story. But anyway, these podcasts kind of started with them. Uh, I just interviewed them online because I'm like, what am I going to do this month? I don't know what to do. So I decided, okay, I'll talk to Ava and Zen and have a podcast I like, like Joy does. And it was fantastic. And then the next one I did, I think, was bees. And then, and then I did one on beer. I knew a guy who started his own micro or nano brewery. Um, he's wonderful, by the way, Joy. If you haven't interviewed Jewel yet, I'll, I'll give you his hookup. He's fantastic. And Vince Ng, also here in Kyoto with Mosaic Farms. He's amazing, too. He'd be a great guest for you, I think. Um, but... Um, you know, one guy grows hops, the other guy uses hops to make, you know, beer. I was like, I want to make this conversation happen. And it was so much fun. And then I did one with volunteers and actually um, Clementine was, was on that one. And I did one, you yeah, know, I've done several now and they're a lot of fun. There are a lot of work is, and I come to really respect what you do, Joy. It's a lot of prep and it's a lot of running around and a lot of technical stuff that I'm really, really bad at. And so I started doing these things and I feel like suddenly things are starting to happen because not to me necessarily, but for the people that I'm connecting others to and everything else. So um, it's nice. It's like we poach each other's guests, right? We're like, ooh, I saw that person. I want to have that person on my show now. Yeah. So organization. We all support working. and build off what each other is doing, right? Uh, which is so wonderful. And sometimes I'll meet people and and they have kind of a sense of rivalry of of not wanting to share. But I think the more we share, the stronger we are. So I'm really happy when I see you interviewing guests and I get excited about listening to what you're doing and then I want to get in touch with them and extend the conversation. I think the more we're talking about these things, the better. Now you also, Chuck, you did a big collaborative project uh, with students in the US. Do you want to talk about that a little bit? That was exciting, building your fence system Change of things and they started in kyoto about four years ago and i was w there for the first year and they did a uh, a composting program for me that year and it's been great because the students are really into the the project and so um, they get to learn a lot and i got to receive at the end a real professional presentation and a uh, way to carry out what it is that i wanted to do and it just brought a sense of formality to things and it connected connected me to young people because being that I'm 50 this year, I found that, okay, I'm, I'm a bit out of the loop for what do young people think about and talk about. And here comes this group of students to kind of clue me in, well, Chuck, if you want to advertise, you want to do it this way. And if you want to do this, you want to do it that way. And I felt like they really gave me a leg up in a lot of ways, but also a great proposal uh, for uh, my solar powered uh, system. But this year um, we're doing something incredibly exciting. 
which is um, the first thing is I wanted to do a community outreach education program. So I'd been I've been teaching English here in Japan for 24 years uh, or 23 years, and I gave it up to do farming full time this year in in February March. But now I'm thinking, you know what? I think I'd like to start teaching people on the farm in English, you know, and that's as much or as little English as you can manage and as much or as little farming as you can manage. But giving the people, again, an opportunity to come out to the farm, to see the vegetables growing, to touch the soil, you know, to harvest something, to taste it, and listen to slash speak a little bit of English and be given an opportunity to practice. I know a lot of people do the farm experience and, and farm education and farm tours. I don't know anybody who's doing it with this English element. So I'm hoping this will kind of give people one more reason to come out and uh, see the farm, touch the vegetables and support people doing this kind of thing. So on your YouTube channel, you have a video mm -hmm. like that, the farm lesson, the Midori farm lesson. And I love that idea, yep. right? Bringing people uh, to right. give them the confidence, not only of farming, but to give them a really natural reason to practice English. And I think this is a great way to level up your English communication skills, but also try something new, learn about farming kind of from a different angle. Exactly, exactly. That's exactly right. And yes, this was a, a woman who came up, uh, just a single person who came up uh, for private lessons and stuff like that. And we, we had some fun out there and we took video video shooting is not my forte so the video itself isn't so great but um yeah this is the kind of thing i'm getting into so now what what you told me about the reason you needed the fence was because of monkeys right are you still having to battle the monkeys every day you know uh, I saw some monkeys, families of monkeys along the way, groups of monkeys. And yeah. and Chuck was saying, oh, no, the monkeys. And then you showed me this enclosure as the only place that you can grow anything and keep the monkeys out. OK, uh, while Chuck's coming back in. So this is uh, one of the plots that Chuck has taken over. Uh, in the beautiful Shiga area and uh, worked on making this electric fence uh, with the students. Chuck, that's okay. We're just talking about your fence have to try it and uh, having people out to volunteer at your farm. So do you want to talk a little bit uh, more about the WPI project? Is it kind of going on to uh, making short films for people working in sustainability? Is that right? Okay, yes, this, this image you're showing now, looking for individuals, um, that's where it all started, the second project. Um, the first slide you showed about me talk, talking to potters, um, you don't have to flash back to, but um, that was one of my Midori Farm Talk podcasts that I was doing this past summer. And I realized it's the first podcast I'm going to be doing live because these two potters are in my village. And... Um, I wanted to do it live with them, and they're very nice people. I've known them for 20 years. Um, they're like my family. They helped me get started farming, and I really wanted to support them. They, they, they've been doing pottery for 35 years, I think, and they just created their own little studio and a gallery up there, and I wanted people to know about them. So I decided, I'm going to do a podcast with you guys, and they said, okay, that's fine, but we speak bad English. I said, that's fine. We'll wait through it. But I thought, you know, rather than just having my iPhone set up on a tripod, I want to make this better and uh, I'm going to reach out to the Facebook community to see if I can in involve more people. So I just asked, hey, can anybody help me do this video stuff? I've got a bit of grant money. I can give you some money and I'll give you lunch and you'll be supporting a sustainable effort. Well, like four or five people contacted me and I found two great people to do it and they did a great video. You saw the drone footage there briefly. Um, they put all together with the subtitles and the great lighting. And I was really amazed at how many cameras and microphones were involved. It was really spectacular. But not only that, I could tell that the people that had helped me were really into it. They were so happy to have an excuse to use all this equipment and a reason and an opportunity to support an environmental or sustainable effort. And... I thought, you know, driving up to the farm and back with an hour plus change every day, I felt like, you know, I bet there's more people like that. 
And as a farmer starting Midori Farm and trying to get popular or known and get the word out there that, hey, I'm selling vegetables, hey, I'm doing events, this is important stuff, we all should plug in. I had a hard time getting the word out there. And now I feel like, well, I've, I've gotten a little bit of notoriety, so I'm in a good place, but I bet there's a lot of other groups out there doing little sustainable things that could really use some promotional materials. And Joy, what you're doing is great because you're bringing a lot of these projects out into the open and letting people know about them. But I feel like, what if they had a short promotional video? I feel like that is the best way to communicate the most information in the least amount of time in the modern world is just a two or three minute video saying everything you need, boom, and put it on YouTube, put it on Facebook or whatever, and people can watch it at their leisure. But as, as a farmer, I'm like, I can't even operate a microphone, clearly, not much less a camera and all the editing that goes in. So I decided for the Worcester Polytechnic Institute project, let's find groups of uh, s small startups initiatives that are sustainable and that want promotional content, a short video, and people who are, yeah, I'm a hobbyist, I can, I can put something together for them, and put those groups together. Have them create content over the next three to six months. And then at the end of it, we're going to host a film festival and have a big screening of all the films. And we'll have uh, judges. We'll have uh, little prizes to give out. And then we'll launch those out into the world and have one more prize for the Internet Prize. Whoever gets the most likes gets the third prize. You know, So it's like the judge's prize. And then it's like the audience prize. By a round of applause, who likes this video best? And then, okay, now in one month, we're going to give out the internet prize so everybody share these videos out there get the word out for these projects so everybody knows and whoever gets the most likes gets the internet prize so it's kind of like this this circular thing um that everybody wins awesome. um are they willing to travel to other areas of japan or to work uh on location or online uh how does that work people reach out to you and then you put them in touch that would be the easiest thing if they just contact me um, at midorifarm.net and my website is fine or through Facebook or Instagram or just an email is good too. Um, that would be great if I can get content creators and projects interested in this. And again, we're not hiring professional film crews. You know, if professional film crews want to donate of their time, of of course, we'd be happy to have that, but it's not necessary. You could just work on your iPhone and iMovie or whatever you got, and just to put together something is, is enough. We're all on Zoom anyway, so we're all at this new normal of working online, and I feel like, well, you could ask the people in Tokyo, if you're in Kyoto, why don't you take some photos, and I'll make a slideshow, or take some videos, and I'll edit them for you, and I'll add some stuff. I don't even need to to go out and see you. You know, I don't even need to travel across the country to, to get there. We can do this all online. Um, but of course, if groups are close enough or willing enough, they could go out and meet these people and get some footage by themselves. That would be the ideal. But the point being that it's not necessary these days. We're not looking for these, you know, art level videos. We're just looking for something that's that's nice with a simple message and that's well done that takes kind of the work off of the people who are working for the environment or sustainability takes it off of their plate because they're probably busy enough working a job to pay money to get money and in their free time working on the sustainability initiatives so i know what that's like and i, I my, my word to everybody out there who's doing that keep it up it's worth it it's worth it and i love i've never read the book but the title do what you love and the money will follow I've always followed that. And it's not about the money. It's about what you love, but the money is necessary. So let's help get the word out there and let other people know about what you're doing and how important it is and how they can plug into it. When you said that just now, it reminded me of that great uh, video, The Organic Farmer, uh, that somebody did for your channel, where it's so clear, Chuck, that you talk about you didn't start off thinking you wanted to be an organic farmer, but now you really feel like being an organic farmer is something you think about every morning when you wake up and every night before you go to bed. And it's just an embedded part of your DNA right now. And I just I love that concept. Embed it as a part of who you are right? You're not just growing vegetables. You're not just, you know, doing work. Yeah. This is, this is who you are now. 
really, really true. And it's taken me over unexpectedly. Um, again, like you said, with that, there was no plan for it. But every mo every night before I go to bed, I'm thinking about what's the weather going to be like? What, what jobs am I going to do? How many customers do I have? How many baskets do I have to fill? Da, 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 da. Who's volunteering and everything else? And then when I wake up in the morning, it's right to it. It's like, okay, I know, I know I need to take this to work. I need to bring my lunch. I need to get my water to refill. I have to to bring my kitchen scraps to compost them so it's all my life now it's really really my lifestyle as organic farming has really taken me over and i'm so pleased joy that you chose this video um because it, first of all it's an amazing guy made for me and um, my hat's off to him and the fun the the coincidental part of it is this is one of the gentlemen who came out and helped me film the potters for the original outreach, like, hey, can anybody help me out? Not only that, but he's in, he was the one who really helped inspire me to do this film uh, festival project. And he's on our team now. He's actually working with us. <clears throat> on the, he's on the technical side. He's going to be kind of in charge of reaching out to the content producers. Yeah. And I'm actually meeting him tonight at the local brew pub. To, so Chris Pond, everybody. He's a wonderful gentleman, and you can find him on Instagram. The people. So there are those people out there who may not, you know, may not have the work boots and the coveralls. And, and sun hat to go out and do what we do for sustainable whatever it is cleaning up the river reducing plastic or growing organic vegetables but they want to do something and they have the skills they have the technology you know they can contribute as well and for what he did for me stands alone you know just watch it the organic farmer on his youtube channel or mine and you'll see what's possible with someone who really knows what they're doing yeah, it's great to see. And it's not it's not like you said, it's not just about uh, shooting the high highest quality video available, having the best editors. You could even take some of this footage yourself wherever you are and work with people who know about editing and putting the videos together so that you have something you can put online, which is so professional like this it, and it really reaches such a wide audience when it's at a higher quality um i struggle with it too i'm still learning you know and it's i've done it for you know the whole coronavirus time doing interviews and i'm still learning and still having hurdles so i think for people like us that are so focused on the sustainability side it's so nice to have people to collaborate with who know the technical side and can add that bit of expertise to take it to another level this is a gorgeous video and she just she contacted me and said hey i'd like to volunteer sometimes and this was one of the third or fourth times she came out. She ended at the farm a couple of days. She's also volunteering with some people in Kobe. So there's also other collateral benefits to these videos is you never know who's going to see it and be inspired to come out and do something or talk to some other people. So like I said, these short videos, I think, are the real catalyst for a lot of these small groups and individuals who are really trying to get something important going. Um, you never know what's going to happen. And at the very least, these groups of people then are going to come together and network with each other and be like, hey, you're doing that initiative that I'm doing this one. We should talk about this or we should do that. I want to visit you. But or even the short videos like you've done on your channel, I've been really impressed with. Like you have a really short four minute video about growing negi, how to grow Japanese green onions. And it has over 7000 views. Let's step back a little bit and talk again about the monkeys and the electric fence and the project you did with the American students. The techno, you know, they're engineering students and they were able to figure out all the schematics necessary to connect uh, solar panels to an inverter and a battery and other uh, devices that would draw off the battery and rate it saying, well, with this size solar panel, you can run this many appliances or whatever you're running and still be okay and things like that. So they brought a lot of technical knowledge and uh, uh, information to the table. And they were also able to help, help me set everything up and imagine why somebody wants to do this. Um, because where I'm farming, there are houses nearby, but I don't own them and I don't have access 
access to outlets. So if I want to have a, a solar power, if I want to have anything electrical, I have to use solar power. And you might have remembered, Joy, one of my biggest problems is monkeys. And so the only way to really keep them out is an electric fence. So these solar powered electric fences they sell here in Japan, they're really expensive. And I haven't bought one, but I've heard that they're not that strong that um, the monkeys will learn to just touch them a few times and get shocked, you know, send in the, the, the you know, not the, 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 the top of the monkeys won't touch it, but, you know, send in the other guys, they'll, they'll take turns touching it until it's, it's weak enough that we can all get over, you know, things like that. So monkeys are really smart. So building- Yeah, so that's been a really big help for you. And I noticed in the last video, um, the organic farmer video, you actually have a net over the top as well. Is that because the monkeys were getting in even over the electric fence? If you didn't have it over well, the top as well? Well, actually, um, yes to everything. But the, the, the monkeys are so smart, they do circumvent whatever I do. And like I mentioned earlier, I've also started farming in Keihoku this year. My original farms are in Kutsuki, which is in Shiga Prefecture, about an hour and change from my house, north, northeast. And the Keihoku farms are about an hour from my house, north, direct. And um, in Keihoku, there are monkeys in, near the mountains, but I'm away from the mountains enough where I don't get monkeys on my farm, which was one of the big selling points for me to start farming there. Um, they have other animals, but um, one of the biggest problems with Keihoku is crows. <clears throat> crows like to come in and uh, steal my cucumbers and other things. And actually there's something on my YouTube channel about that, like the crow versus the cucumber video. It's quite short, um, but I think it's well done. And it outlines how smart they are because a crow visits the farm the first day and it's picking that thing, looking at this cucumber, oh, it's too small, comes back the next day, picks it up with its beak and drops like, nope, not big enough, flies away. The third day it goes in there and it, I mean, better than I can do it myself, it grabs a cucumber, snaps it off and flies away with it, like a, a, a full size cucumber. And I realized they don't need thumbs, you know, they're so smart. So the only thing that keeps them out is a net over the top of the farm. And everyone oh, was so God. tickled that, oh, I'm so glad you gave it to him at the end. And the funny thing is, was I had no idea what was doing this to my cucumber. Chuck, uh, we had a great interview with uh, Japan Trail Cam. Uh, two guys in Kyushu that go and set up these cameras in the forest and they capture all the wildlife of all the, the wild animals that are walking by the forest camp. So if you're interested in that, uh, definitely go and check that out. Um, but you did that as well to find out what was eating your vegetables. Uh, this is beautiful green peas. Let's talk about some of the vegetables you've had success growing organically at your farms. So you've had peas, uh, cucumbers, eggplants. Tell us some of your best crops. Well, that cucumbers and carrots are always a standard and whatever's extra I put into jars with some pickling solution. Um, and I sell that way. It's called an added value product. Um, but I also really, what I really like growing is things in the cucurbit family, um, especially squashes and zucchinis. Um, they're just one of my favorite foods to eat and to grow. It's a very robust plant. Um, I feel like those are some of my favorites. Um, but I also grow lots and lots of beans this year. I think I grew 10 or 15 varieties of beans this, this year. Um, oh, wow. And I grew, for the first time, I grew out soybeans properly. I've, I've grown edamame several years, but the monkeys always yeah. take them. They love them. So I was able yeah. to grow those in Kehoku this year, and I got some great edamame, and then I grew them out uh, to full size, and I got the big black dried soybeans as well, which is exciting. Uh, when you, when that you is think exciting. This is, a real, this is a real sustainable thing because once they're full size and dried, you can keep them for years, and at any time yeah. then eat them or plant them and grow some more. So that was great for and me to feel real connected. To that. And what are you what are you uh, selling here? Is this pesto? And it looks like hummus. Is this from your? Crop? Oh, that is a hummus. Yep, that's pesto that I don't make from basil usually. I usually make it from things like kale and broccoli leaves and carrot leaves and things like that. So it's kind of reusing something that may not have otherwise been eaten, and it's healthier than basil, and it's all vegan. 
Um, I just use like six or seven ingredients. I use garlic, olive oil, salt, whatever leaves I'm using. And then I use uh, walnuts and I use uh, tahini, basically, which is neri goma in Japanese. Um, and probably something else, maybe a little bit of paprika or something like that, or chili. It's so um, smart make- because that's a great way to have a longer shelf life. And we know that if you can give people something healthy and convenient in terms of long shelf life, that's a great way to get people attracted to vegan products and locally grown products. There just isn't enough in Japan. We need more ideas like this. This is great. Um, I just don't see see the kinds of beans that I was growing. I grew uh, asparagus beans or snake beans. Um, this year, it's called yard long beans. They're really super long beans that are, are about um, two, three feet, two, two foot long, you know, about uh, 50 or 60 centimeters long. And they're really tasty and really beautiful. And um, <clears throat> I grew up black beans as well, proper Mexican style black beans and pinto beans, which are also, you grow them out till the, and same thing with the full size soybeans, you grow them until the plant dies. And the, the pods are brown and yellow and spotted with black. And then you crack those open and you've got your dried beans. So it's super easy to do and really sustainable. And this is my first year doing it. And I felt like, wow, this, this is going to lead me somewhere. I'm not sure where yet, but this is a great new direction because this is not only food, this is seeds, you know, and that's, that's a real sort of circular uh, product for me. I feel like whatever we can eat, we plant next year. I mean, that's the same for potatoes. Um, right. Another exciting crop that I think I, I, that I think is exciting that I grew this year was uh, Jerusalem artichokes, which are also called sunchokes or, or kiku imo in, in Japanese. And these are amazing plants that grow, you know, three meters tall, have these little mini sunflowers on them. And then they produce all these tubers that are really yummy. And then you just plant those out again the next year. Um, yeah, and I, think I, I talked to... Show- I talked to Thomas Klepfer uh, from Pitchfork Farms in Hiroshima. He turned me on to them. They're delicious. But also, if you don't harvest them all, they'll regrow next year. So there's no downside uh, to growing those. It helps rebuild the soil as well. And I know Heather Fukase, who you talked to on your series, uh, we just talked last week and she was talking about growing those sunchokes as well in Nagano. So it seems like a crop that grows pretty much anywhere in Japan, which is great to hear. That's right. And I mean, <clears throat> it is nice that if you don't harvest some of them, they keep coming back. But the thing is, they can be quite invasive as well because they're they're their way of producing is they just multiply underneath the soil and then suddenly you've got a whole bed full of them where you're trying to grow broccoli. And because I wanted to kind of sequester them and control them and, and not have that happen, I grew them in these giant containers. And just two days ago, I had a new friend come out and help me harvest them. And it was wonderful because I think we got about 10 or 15 kilograms from these 11 giant containers. And I only planted 23 little small um, tubers and I got so many it, it's a really highly productive plant and I won't have that problem because I grew them in containers I dumped out all the soil sifted through the whole thing got every single one and I put the soil back in the container it's ready for next year so if to all you growers out there if you do want to control them I highly recommend some really really big containers full of some really rich soil with compost with good drainage and keep them watered because those things do like water but very easy to grow like you said and very tasty just watch out we shouldn't eat too many because they are a natural laxative yeah why yeah I it the first year and found out uh, i would say the hard way easy, the easy to way. do <laughs> easy to do um one one other thing which has recently come up in conversation with farmers is about the changing climate right as the summers get hotter and the winters get shorter uh, winters can have more snow, even with climate change. Uh, there was that discussion in the government when that uh, not so clever person was saying Hokkaido rice is more delicious because of climate change. And the Hokkaido farmers were actually saying, actually, we're having to change the kind of vegetables that we grow, including rice, because of climate change. Is this something that you've also been thinking about? For sure. I mean, nobody knows about climate change more than farmers. 
because we're working in the climate. I mean, you you see it when it. I like I like asking people, hey, when was the last drought? Nobody knows. Nobody knows but farmers. Because when there's no rain, we got to be out there watering and putting you know mulch down and things like that. And we had a really really dry fall. We went almost a whole month of October with very very little rain, and it was it was really tough because. Like I said, these plants need water and these plants are used to a certain moisture in the atmosphere, not just in the soil. And it just gets really, really hard, harder to take care of them. And there's some crops we just can't do. Um, and of course, there's gonna be those people who are pointing to the two or three crops that actually did better, you know, because of this, like peppers did really, really well and tomatoes did really, really well because they like water, but they put down deep roots and, and when there's less water, they're sweeter and things like that. But that's that's shining a light on a, on, a, on you know, a bright spot of a very big problem. Climate change is huge for us. And one of the things also people don't realize is, well, I used to get over a meter of snow um, in, in, in Kutsky. And that was when I first started going up there about 15, 20 years ago. And every year it's gotten a little bit less, a little bit less. And last year it was like a foot of snow, like 30 centimeters for a month or two. And that was it. And the problem, one of the collateral uh, problems with that is the insects wake up earlier and these insects might have a one to three month life cycle um, that are eating my plants and suddenly they're started earlier so by the time summer comes along they're exponentially greater in numbers because more more cycles have gone through by the time it's really hot in summer and suddenly i'm overwhelmed and for somebody who doesn't spray chemicals of course more insects is a huge problem and so there's a lot of little things going on here with climate change that other people just may not realize. But for farmers, we know what's happening. We know. I'm showing some of your beautiful photos on your Instagram. Uh, so basically, if people want to find out more about the work you're doing, go to Midori Farm. Um, dot net. Midori Farm on Instagram and Facebook. Those are your main channels, right, Chuck? That's right. Yeah, beautiful right. stream. This is in front of the farm that I visited in Shiga, I believe. My commute to work is through the places people go on the weekend to go sightseeing. So basically, I drive through gorgeous areas every day, and I see the snow change to the cherry blossoms, to, to the summer skies, to the fall leaves, and right back through it. So I love my commutes. They're always beautiful. And I try to snap pictures when I can, but... Like I said, that, that's part of my salary because I don't make a lot of money, but I certainly have a lot of happiness in my life and a lot of beauty and a lot of joy, uh, a lot of health. Because I quit teaching, I'm farming all the time. I lost some weight and I've really slimmed down and I feel much more energetic because we're supposed to be moving our body, people, and not just walking to work or to the supermarket, but actually squatting down, getting under the dirt, lifting something heavy, swinging our arms around, carrying something over our heads, you know, moving our body in multiple ways that increases our circulation and makes us much healthier and happier in the long run. So, plus giving up meat and a lot of wheat products has really helped too. So, But one thing I wanted to talk about um, before we left was um, I do accept one day volunteers. Um, I, what I've usually done is accept volunteers from an organization called WorkAway, which is a lot like Woof, if you're familiar with that. And I'm using another one out of Belgium, similar volunteer organization. And I would have people stay for one to three months at the farm. I have a little house for them to stay in. They help every day. They learn about farming. They live the natural life. You know, they get the bug bites and the sunburn, but they also get great smiles on their face. They get to jump in the clean, crystal clean water of the river every day after work and hike up the mountain on their days off. Um, but now I'm accepting one day volunteers. So if anybody wants to come out for the day or just a couple of days, please get in touch with me too, because this way your, your efforts are straight towards an organic, natural, sustainable project to create food and to educate people about that. And you're gonna feel better about it and you're gonna be helping me and the whole community out. So I invite anybody to come out. And Joy, you came out for the day and I think you had fun planting onions. So- Oh, it was great, it was great. It's for everybody. <laughs> Yeah. And you made me a nice lunch. I volunteered for a few hours. I uh, interviewed you and put it up on my YouTube channel as well. And that's that's had so many people 
watching and enjoying and learning about the farm through my eyes, which is nice. Michael we- on Facebook says, good morning from Hokuto Yamanashi. I'm inspired by many young generation organic farmers around the world like yourself. Many young people are interested and willing to do farming, but has big concerns about its commercial stability in Japan. Question, what do you do with your produce? How's your revenue stream? Wow, great question. Thanks, Michael. Thank you, Michael. And I'm 50 years young. Thanks for calling me of the younger generation. Um, But um, you're right. Small organic farmers like me struggle for economic sustainability. And I'm still struggling, um, which is why I'm trying to institute an education program to offset that. Um, Because I want to base everything from the farm, leveraging the farm for more opportunities like tourism and things like that. But the way I sell my vegetables is through a CSA, Community Supported Agriculture, which is teike in Japanese. And it's basically a subscription system. People get a basket a week for 2,000 yen or 2,500, depending. And and, um, it's delivered straight to their door uh, or they pick it up at my house or a drop-off point. Uh, No plastic at all no packaging, fresh from the farm, all organic. So I think that's a pretty good deal for everybody. Um, I have a couple of customers this week. I sell about anywhere between 10 and 20 baskets a week. So that's that's kind of paying for my costs and giving me a little bit of beer money. Um, So I am looking into other ways to to again, stay farming while making more money to support my family and myself in my later years, so. I think that's such an important question, right? Like it, it's something um, I'll be talking to a sustainability consultant in Tokyo this Wednesday about uh, Tova Kinoka as well. Um, how to find that balance, right? Like we need people to think about sustainability and funding and supporting them financially, that this expectation that if you're doing good for a community or for the environment, it should be free or funded only by taxpayers, I think it's it's outdated and it doesn't work, right? So if you can find a way to be financially viable, that's so important for sustainability. So You know, I just like, the, it's, it's also connects me with my, the people who are eating the vegetables. They ask me what's coming next week or how are the monkeys or how do I cook this or what the heck is this? You know, I've never seen yeah. a, you know, a fennel before or something like that. So, yeah. yeah. And then do you often like uh, go to farmer's markets in Kyoto or take part in other like sales activities, like a big market where all the farmers get together? Does that work as well? I've done that. Um, It's not my first choice. Um, For one thing, uh, most of the customers who go there will be Japanese. And unfortunately, the Japanese haven't been given the opportunity yet to really understand the importance of not using plastic around their vegetables. So when they see vegetables without plastic, they don't really think to buy them. So I don't sell a whole lot. And also, basically, a farmer like me works six days a week. What do you want to do on your day off, Chuck? sell vegetables so it's not my first choice while my son is still young enough for me to want to run around with him and one of the community building projects i've also started is i started a chicago softball league or regular monthly game on sundays to bring people together to drink some beer and play play some sports and run around outside Um, so i like to do other things and things other than farming on my day off Um, and if my whole income is based on am I going to make money on my day off even though I'm not using plastic and things like that like I said I've tried it five or ten times and it just wasn't for me the CSA is is really the way to go yeah it sounds like a, a good way to support your local farmer get great produce as well and I know uh Heather Fukase in Nagano she does a similar thing And she also puts on uh, things that are in season that she's ready to ship out on her website. Have you started doing that as well? I saw that on your website. Um, I don't really ship very much. I try to sell local as much as I can. It's just kind of a personal initiative, but I'm willing to ship vegetables if people ask me, but it will be more expensive. Enough people in your local area that you can have enough demand for what you can provide. That's awesome. Chuck, anything you want to mention before we finish? Joy, I just wanted to say one thing, which is thank you for creating this opportunity for people to share their work and their passions for sustainability. Um, 
it's 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 fantastic to have the chance to spread the word and to hear other people's projects and it's so encouraging to hear what other people are doing and it's inspiring to know that um, people are out there and you know against all odds against the grain they're still making things happen because honestly that's where it's got to be we we can't go mainstream for sustainability we've got to go off the beaten track and kind of blaze a trail ourselves and it's hard and we've got a lot of scratches and bumps and bruises and yeah it's not financially viable but that's part of it i think that little bit of suffering kind of brings us over to the realization of what's important in life so joy just a big thank you to you and uh, everybody who i've seen on your show is fantastic so thanks to all of them as well thank you so much jack and i i enjoyed my volunteer morning with you last year and i hope i can get there before too long now that travel is eased up a little bit and we'll have to do a another follow-up video maybe on an, a new plot that you're managing different farms now i'd love to see the other ones mm -hmm. yeah I, I don't know if you saw the image but i was harvesting persimmons um the other day and this 83 year old man who used to live in this 200 year old house and there's a hundred year old persimmon tree and I'm up there with a homemade ladder and a piece of bamboo with notches cut in it, snapping up, it's five meters long and it's way above my head. And I, no sound of man is on my videos and it's just wonderful experience to feel like I could be doing this 200 years ago and doing the exact same thing in the exact same way. And that sort of connection to our culture and time and how nice technology is, but sometimes how we really don't need it. Uh, um, so things like that, those experiences, I'm hoping to reach out and give people the opportunity to do that more and more for themselves. So next year, and I'm going to probably run some persimmon harvesting events too. So you should come out for that. That's wonderful. Yeah, I'd love that. Uh, we have a, a small persimmon tree, which was a, a gift from the previous owners of this house that we remodeled this old house. Um, but I think that's a gap, isn't it, in, in Japan right now? There's a lot of fruit rotting on the trees. And Thomas Clifford at Pitchfork Farms talked about this too, offering to get volunteers to go and pick the fruit and give some of the fruit to the local people living there. But why not use the rest and sell and create a new system of providing labor because there's just such a shortage right now, right? That's right. That's right. And Thomas is great. I really like what he's doing too. Awesome. I love talking to you guys. You are all doing such great work in different parts of Japan. It's wonderful to have so many of you in my series. I hope to have hundreds of organic farmers in the talk show series by the time I finish. <laughs> that would well, be great. Love it too, Thanks for the chance. And I'll give you a list of people that I think might be suitable for you if you're interested. Awesome. Awesome. Look forward to it. Thank you so much, Chuck. Thank you, everybody, for joining. And uh, see you again next time. Take care. Go and grow some of your own food, even in your small balcony or garden. Right, Chuck? Yes, that's right. And thanks, everybody, for joining us today.